Hey folks, welcome to the show. We got a great one today. We got Peter here with us and we're talking indeterminate tomatoes. Welcome to the Road by Road Gardening Show, the best dead gum gardening show on the internet where we talk about gardening, a little bit of cooking, and growing your own food. Now sit back and enjoy. Hey folks, I'm Greg and Peter, as I mentioned, is here from Seminus. From Seminus, thank you. And we are lucky enough to have Peter here a couple times a year. And we're talking indeterminate tomatoes because Peter's company owns the garden indeterminate tomato business. Has for a long time. Yep. So we are going to maybe debunk some myths, maybe give some good information on uh, how to suckle those tomatoes, how to grow those tomatoes, how to treat them. But first of all, you got to try something right here, Peter. I think I know what that is. Yep. This right here is freeze dried squash. Did it first for me. Yep. You're going to be blown away. So the wife has been freeze drying everything. Wow, the texture of that. It's neat, ain't it? And it's got a pretty good flavor to it. It's like a puff. It is. So we have freeze drawn, uh, dried blueberries, uh, squash, you name it, she's done it. But I think this is one of, the, one of my tops right there in squash. It's got just, it holds the flavor more than some I think of the texture is what's surprising. Mm hmm it's like a, one of those right. puff chips. So you can reconstitute this in water and cook it. So this is the way to preserve your food. And wow, I think it'll last somewhere 30 years. Now, 30 years is probably going to outdo me. But you might not get me to try it in 30 years. <laughs> Have to be blended up as baby food <laughs> if we eat it in 30 years. Hmm. Now, I thought you'd find that interesting. It's freeze-dried squash. Hmm. Huh. So last week on our show, we was talking about okra. And in comments, we asked people to put in there the way they would prefer to have their okra. What do you think the winner was? I now would you got say boiled, stewed, fried, all of that. My obvious guess would be fried. And he was right. Yep, fried okra was the winner last. Have you ever had fried smashed okra? I have. It's really That's good. the way I do it. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okra is a southern thing. It's becoming. It's kind of inching up a little bit. Way the them northerners are starting to catch on our secrets, but we love our fried okra. Yep. Have not planted mine yet? I'm close. Really? Yep, next week. Yep. Cool. I got mine in the ground. It's, I transplanted mine, but I got mine in the ground. So, indeterminate tomatoes. Now, to start off with, Peter works for Simness, and Simness is the breeder for most of the home garden varieties of indeterminate tomatoes. But not just tomatoes, I mean, what about peppers? Y'all are huge in the peppers. In the commercial side, yep. we're the dominant player in peppers, yeah. Speaking of peppers, yep. you recognize this one? Yep, I think you know what that is too. That's a That's that's oscillator. That's oscillator bell pepper there, and it's turning red there. So in case most people didn't understand the color thing with bell pepper, explain that real quick. Well, obviously green, green bell peppers are green first, and then red comes from green. Right. So uh, most of the commercial bell peppers you will buy in a grocery store which we breed for, are bred to turn red really late and they turn more of a blotchy kind of. This is not a, a product that would go into a retail commercial store. Right. However, nothing wrong with eating that. So right. perfectly natural transformation from green to red. We do breed varieties that turn red faster. So Red Knight's one y'all have carried and do carry that is bred to turn red really fast mm -hmm. and is designed to be harvested red by commercial packer shippers or home gardeners. So um, all green bell peppers will turn either red, yellow, or orange eventually, if you leave them on the plant. Um, these were taken off the plant last week, I think you said, and mm -hmm. they have just turned naturally as they've aged. Mm -hmm. but big, big, nice bell pepper. I'm, I'm super excited about this Hulsinator series here. That has got disease resistance as well. Yes, particularly for the South, has mm -hmm. tomato spotted wilt virus resistance, which home gardeners are not going to be able to manage through any any process, chemi chemically or uh, rotationally or anything like that. It's spread by thrips, and they move in and out, and um, they transmit it with almost instantly from the time they feed on the pepper plant. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to control them. If you get tomato spotted wilt virus in your garden, there's really not much you can do about that plant. You have to discard the plant, throw it away, because it's not going to be productive, particularly right. in the case of peppers. Right. So having the resistance for a southern gardener to spot a wilt resistance is a big plus. You know, the, I guess this 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 Hulsinator bell pepper makes a big, pretty, 
bell pepper, but I guess the best way to put it, it's easy to grow. Easy to grow and reliable. Yep. And you don't really, you can take out the concern about investing your time and effort in putting a plant in the ground that's not got tomato spotted wilt virus resistance and then losing the plant. I got one more we got to talk about real quick if I can get it. Boom. boom. And here we have the Hallucinator Jalapeno. Yeah, it's a great, great product. Yep. Yep. Nice one there. It's not extremely hot. Would you call it mid level hot? It's kind of mid tier, yeah. Mid -tier? There's there's uh there's varieties, <laughs> some older varieties in particular that were known to be really hot. And then there's some genetics in the marketplace now that are known to be very mild. Mm -hmm. And of course there are no heat jalapenos. Right. But this would be considered middle of the road. Yep, and good disease resistance as well. Great disease resistance, particularly for southern gardens. Yep. 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 Easy to grow. You Reliable know, and easy to grow. Reliable and easy to grow. We got the CSP. And that's the Hall Snader series there that we're working on. We were just man, we it's been great to be able to bring out these varieties, give people the opportunity to be able to be successful growing peppers. A lot of people struggle with peppers, but with these Hall Snader series here, it can be it can be as easy. Just as take possible. some of the some of the risk factors out. Yep, that's the goal. Yep. All right, folks, so let's move in. Work real quick before we do. Yellow Doll Watermelon. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite watermelons. Yep. And I got it planted this year, and that comes from you guys. Yep. I highly, the two watermelons I recommend for the home garden is Sangria and Yellow Doll. I love that Yellow Doll. It is sweet, sweet, sweet. Man, it's just a, it's a, another one that's easy to grow. Yep, yep, and it's it's not new. It's been around a while, but it's, it's that age of it has mm -hmm. proven its reliability. Mm -hmm. I mean, we sell quite a bit through the years and, and I think it's getting more popular now as people culinary wise are realizing there's yellow watermelons out there. You've seen them in grocery stores seedless wise, but you can grow a, a seeded yellow meat, mm -hmm. yellow doll for instance, very easily in your home garden. And it's not a huge watermelon, it's a smaller watermelon, so it works well for being up in the refrigerator. Or yeah, that's what we call an ice box melon. Yep. That term comes right. from the fact it was small enough to right. 10 to 12 pounds, probably maxes out at 10 to 12 pounds. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's get to the meat of the show. We're talking about tomatoes. Now, we all know tomatoes is the most popular thing grown in the garden because everybody loves a good tomato sandwich. If you don't, you should. You're missing out on life if you've not eaten a, a good tomato sandwich. One of my favorite things that yep. possible to me. You put a tomato sandwich, a good one next to a steak, hey, I love a good tomato sandwich. And we talk about Varieties that's been around for a long time. I think about Rutgers. I think about some of those varieties. But when we think about indeterminates, we think of what? Better Boy. Better Boy, Big Beef. Big Beef. So, you know, those types have been yep. around for since the eighties. So, so Big Beef has been around since Better Boy has? Yeah, they were all kind of in the same four to five year period. Really? Okay. So we're gonna I'm gonna list out the ones we're gonna talk about today real quick. And we're talking about indeterminates. We're gonna talk about Better Boy, Big Beef, Purple Boy. Yep. Lemon Boy, Pink Delicious, and of course we're going to talk about Sun Sugar a little bit too because we got to yeah. talk about Sun Sugar. All right, so let's talk about the slicers. The slicers first will be your Better Boys, your Big Beef, your Purple Boy, and your Lemon Boy, and I guess your Pink Delicious would fall in there as well. Yeah, I think yeah. that's fair. And Pink Girl. All right, so these are indeterminate type tomatoes. Yep. And uh, they got a little different growth habitat than determinants. We talked about determinants a week or two ago. Let's talk about indeterminates because they take a little bit different care. They have different growth habitat yep. or habit habitat habit than determinant types. And for you guys that don't know the difference between indeterminate and determinant, you know one of the best ways to keep up with it and make it simple is you just think about determinant. It's got a determined height. Yep. Indeterminant can go on and grow on. And we're talking about indeterminates. All right, on YouTube, and there's all kind of things on YouTube out there. They talk about pruning tomatoes. A lot of things out there that I don't necessarily agree with. They also talk about pinching them off and leading them. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some best practices on indeterminate slicers on pruning and maybe pinching off or trellising. What do you call that? Leaders coming off from mm -hmm. there? Yeah. What's your thoughts? Term. What's your thoughts? Well, indeterminates as a general rule are obviously going to grow and keep growing. And what what generally happens is you can go one of a couple of routes. A lot of folks you'll hear talk about single leader or single stem pruning. What they're referring to is they're going to take every sucker off the plant as it as it forms in the nose. Somebody described this as this. it's the armpit of the plant. Fair. <laughs> but that I'm sucker's going to come up. right in there. If y'all can see here where I'm pointing here, right in there is where that sucker's going to come out at. And single leader 
people will will harp will take every sucker out as the plant grows they end up with a very tall plant not much foliage the fruit are very exposed they're open and typically where i see people do that is one they're they're visual people they want to see you know they want to see the fruit more than they want to see a plant or they're in a small space then they want a tall narrow plant which that will provide you'll have no not really any foliage that'll grow outside of the sort of main channel trunk of the plant um, or they um, are growing so many things in a small space they want to be able to you know visually see it get around it and, and typically it's for people that are higher input people that want to spend more time in the garden for going out to go out every day to prune tomatoes is something they'd want to do i i don't have that privilege where my garden is i only get to get in the garden about once or twice a week so i don't do single leader but a lot of people do yeah it's more of a pretty thing yeah, yeah the thing about single leader is it, it it limits your yield potential because suckers will form flowers which will form fruit so by taking all the suckers off the plant you are limiting the yield potential of the plant if you're fine with that that's 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 okay but that is one of the side effects of pruning all your suckers off is you don't get yield off suckers mm -hmm. also i've seen somebody talk about pinching the top off and have two liters and i'm assuming maybe two sucker liters come out and leave that and have two liters now that may work okay in a high tunnel production where they yeah. where they trellising them and they're pinning them and they're supporting them all the way to the top but from a garden situation where you're putting a tomato cage on there, it's not the way to go. No, it, it, it's it's the common practice, and it's what's done in protected culture or greenhouse tomatoes, hydroponic tomatoes, mm -hmm. uh, that have a grafted uh, rootstock underneath them that implies vigor to both of those laterals or leaders or whatever term you want to call them. That is standard practice in that business. For home gardeners, one, we typically don't graft, and so we don't have the, the vigor in a rootstock attached to that plant that's going to give it enough enough uh, vigor to, to produce both leaders and produce fruit off both leaders but typically you uh, you will delay maturity significantly and so when we did all of that work um, back in the back a few years ago the number one thing we saw happen was you reduced you you increased maturity you moved maturity out a month or more because that plant has to re, re recalibrate where it's going and then you lost fruit size so for home gardeners I Pinching the top out of a tomato does not really make yeah. a whole lot of economical sense. Right. All right. So we threw with the pinching. No pinching out the tops here. Now let's talk about sucker because this is a controversial subject here. All kind of yeah. information out there. Does it increase fruit size? What is best practices on how far up to sucker and indeterminate? The fruit size question is a little bit variable based on the variety. But as a general rule, the answer is no. Now, intuitively, you think it's yes because, well, you say well, it's going to put more energy into the fruit. But l largely, it is the case that, that fruit size is more genetically determined. And if the plant has enough resources, it will maximize that fruit size, whether it's been, when it's been pruned or not. Um, there's a lot of videos online that, that, that will point that out. And there's, there's research, obviously, behind that. Now, typically, you do want to prune indeterminates at least high enough to get foliage off the ground because you want to keep diseases that are soil borne from splashing up onto leaves and then moving up the plant. So I know you and I were talking earlier, we both do a similar thing. We prune basically indeterminates up to the first flower cluster, which basically gets, gets uh, foliage off the ground up to maybe a foot, foot and a half, depending on the variety. And you're getting basically protection from grounding the diseases that are soil borne from splashing up. And as a general rule, that's probably the what you should do minimally as far as pruning as far as pruning so we want to keep those bottom limbs pruned off so you don't get that disease and everything what about suckers well suckers up the plant has been somewhat on the variety i i, I grow a lot of big beef i only prune the bottom and i leave it alone uh purple boy however is a smaller fruited variety and a lot of commercial guys that are growing as well as home gardens i would encourage you to prune or su take more suckers off even above the first flower cluster uh, to increase fruit size. Now you don't have to do that. You'll have plenty of fruit. They'll just be a little bit on the smaller side. Uh, and if that's if that's what you want, doesn't affect eating quality. Doesn't affect how the fruit looks necessarily. It's just physical dimension. So mm -hmm. play with that. But typically speaking, for most indeterminates, if you can handle the biomass of the plant, you have it in a good cage. You have it in a good trellis. Um, pruning up to the first flower cluster is probably all I would have. I would do. It's all I do do. Right. On any of the varieties. So we got that out of the way. Now there's a lot of different 
confusion can happen with varieties. Um, I have grown all the ones we're going to talk about today, with the exception, I don't think I've ever grown Pink Girl, but Better Boy, which probably got more name recognition than yes. any of them out there. What is the benefits or what is the good characteristics of a Better Boy? In the well, Better tomato? Boy is, is, is typically a very nice slicing size. It's not big, not overly big. It's not going to win any size contest. Just perfectly nice size to go on a sandwich. Historically known as a very good eating tomato. That's probably the biggest thing. Good yielder. And then for us as a business, I mean, Better Boy has been grown not only all over the U.S., but all over the world. Super highly adaptable and reliable. And I think that's one reason it's such a strong product in the, in the plant raiser business where you see it uh, a lot at farm centers and, and big box retailers. It's just an incredibly reliable variety from a performance perspective. May never be the best one, but will never be the worst one. And it provides just a really nice, solid red round tomato. Yep. Uh, next one's big beef. So big I, beef. Is, I, grew, I grew big beef. I, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, big beef, uh, particularly big beef plus, which is is what you guys market is is a. Uh, it's just a really great variety from an eating quality perspective. Super reliable, bigger. Mm -hmm. Most people like its fruit size, and and that's that's one reason I grow it. It's a nice outside the. Outside the crust, I call it variety, so that it hangs over. So, what's the difference in big beef and better boy? Well, obviously, genetically, there's a little bit of a difference. It's, it's mainly fruit size. Okay. Um, and uh, and um, big, big boy has a little bit more of a, of a vertical plant. It's a more aggressive okay. plant. Okay. Um, so, if you are limited on space, a better boy might make more. Up be a better decision because it's not going to get quite big, as Big beef will be a little bit better decision okay. if you're a little bit limited in space. Oh, big beef's going to be smaller than better. Big beef's going to be slightly smaller. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, so we got to move into the to the purples and the lemons. Okay, purple boy. Talk about it a minute because I got to... Uh, so that is it. These next two are at the top of my list as far as taste goes. Yeah, and purple boy is basically a, a hybrid variety that took some parental lines out of the, the long-known great eating quality variety, um, turkey purple. Mm -hmm. And and then it's crossed to some lines out of our program, I believe for South America. And it's just a very reliable product performance variety. It has root knot nematode resistance, you know, has really good performance in the field and then eats really, really good. And it, it yeah. looks like a, a better quality Cherokee purple fruit does, but a little bit smaller. But so it's really got a different size to it. It's going to be, it's going to be more uniform and maybe a little bit smaller than the Cherokee Yeah, and purple. not have that squatty, right. kind of Air heirloomy loomy. shape. Yep. It's going to be more traditionally round shaped. And right. it has that dark purple that we mm -hmm. all love. You know, yep. and they say the darker the, the fruit is, the more antioxidants it has in That's it. That's true. It does taste really well. Uh, Last week we had, uh, I took a pink delicious, I took a big beef, and I took a purple boy. And I sliced it so they couldn't tell what it was. And I didn't tell them. I walked around mm -hmm. the office, let them taste of each one of them, and the purple boy won. Yes, yeah, my, my, my mother's favorite tomato. I've mm -hmm. uh, been growing it in her garden, in our garden for a long time. And uh, it's, it's got a lot of farm stand presence now, particularly in areas where Cherokee purple is popular. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, as a alternate to Cherokee purple, way more productive on a per plant basis. Mm -hmm. And we can't leave up Mr. Lemon Boy. Yeah, Lemon Boy is just a very beautiful little tomato. It's a, it's a, it's not an orange or a yellow. It's that really brilliant lemony yellow, which is unique, actually, in the home garden space. Yep. Um, a lot of people love it for eating quality. It's, it's a typically a a little bit milder flavor, which some putty people really like, and yellows is a ruler that way. I grow up because um, anytime you've got bright red tomatoes out there, the contrast of the yellow is really neat. It's very productive. Yeah. It's been around a long time, and and home gardeners really love to grow it, and mm -hmm. it's super super reliable. So we did a little taste test a few years ago. I remember seeing that, and uh, it was a blindfolded taste test, which is the only way you can truly do a good taste yep. test. And lemon boy won that. Yeah, I, I, it's amazing what people eat, how people eat with their eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't rec you don't recognize it until you are blindfolded and you realize right. that hey, maybe I'm eating more with my eyes than I am with with my actual right. taste bud. So uh, we're going we're going to kind of couple big beef in with the boys. We got big uh, butter boy, we got big beef, purple boy, lemon boy. Now we got 
we got some work has been done with these mm -hmm. varieties here that make them even better as far as disease resistance. Yes, yeah. the plus series, plus series, excuse me. And the goal of the plus series was to, was to improve upon already proven genetics, but provide things that are limiting to those genetics. <coughs> so for instance, tomato spotted wilt virus in the south, southern tier of the U.S., Which basically is zone seven sound down, yep. is a huge limiting factor to these older genetics. By uh, selecting for varieties that keep all the, all the traditional uh, things you love about those varieties, but having tomato spotted wilt virus resistance really enhances the performance of them in the southern garden for sure. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't take away necessarily from performance in a northern garden. Just because it has a resistance doesn't mean that you can't still grow those varieties in a northern northern garden. Yeah. Uh, do you grow any determinants in your garden? I grow. I grow. My dad is a longtime celebrity lover. Okay. So I, but we were losing about three quarters of our plants every year to tomato spot wilt virus. Okay. So I quit growing celebrity for that reason until Celebrity Plus came around, and I, I grow only Celebrity Plus determinants right. in my garden. Right. In Eastern North Carolina. So what, besides the uh, tomato spotted wilt virus, what else do some of these plus series, and folks, if you don't know what the plus series are, you're going to see more and, me, more and more of these within the next two years transition out of the regular better boy, the big beef, more into the pluses as supplies gets, you know, out there and to all the seed companies out there. You're going to see everything transition to the plus series. Yep. Because they have these tomato spot with virus. What else? Can we uh, nematode them? resistance. Nematode, so, which is huge for us. Southern root knot nematode. So um, incognita is the actual name, but it's it's uh, for southern gardeners. Again, mainly zone 7 south. Um, if you don't have nematode problems now, you probably yeah, will. Yep. And uh, the, the, the nice thing about the genetic resistance and all these is from a rotational perspective, it's it's that resistance crashes nematode populations. They think they can feed on them, they can't. They can't reproduce, and your population declines. So, from a rotational perspective, root knot nematode resistance in your variety is the best option for controlling nematodes. Right, because we really just don't have much we just in don't. our arsenal for nematodes. And you know, a lot of people have these small spaces out there. And we get this question all the time. They have to plant tomatoes back in the same spot every year. Yep. They just can't rotate because they just don't have the uh, the land or the spot to do that. So that's where this right here is going to win for everybody. Yeah, and if you're if you're like you and I, we, you know, we may have a spring crop of tomatoes, but that fall we may put cucumbers there, yep. squash there. Right. If nematode, you have nematode resistance in the tomato variety, it really gives you. Uh, a leg up on growing that fall or rotating the next spring cucurbit crop. It's actually a way to control nematodes. It is. Just like you talked about, you starve them out. You so. basically starve them out. They they think they can reproduce on that on that root, but they can't. Mm -hmm. So the population just goes from a baseline down. Yep. All right, so the next we got to talk about is Pink Delicious. Now we've been carrying Pink Delicious for a couple years now. Man, this is a good tomato right here. But I'm going to tell you, that's, and you probably would agree with me. I think where the juice is with this variety right here is for roadside stands. Yeah. Or if you're working farmer's markets and everything, this variety here has got that heirloom look to it. It's got that heirloom taste to it somewhat for a pink tomato. But it's got that look, makes that big old gnarly, pretty tomato. But it's got disease resistance. Yeah, you can it's actually got, grow it. It's got vigor too. Yep. Uh, from hybrid vigor. Mm -hmm. But really, really nice product. And it's a... Part of a trend you're going to see among a lot of breeding companies of taking hybrid, uh, heirloom looking um, genetics and hybridizing them in a way that increases yield potential, disease resistance, things like that, that really don't take away from what you love about them being heirloomy, the, the fascinated look to the, to the, the interior, the really high aromatics that you smell when you eat them, all that's there. It's just in a hybrid form that, that fills in some of the gaps that you don't get with uh, with true heirloom. There again, helps you be successful grow this variety mm -hmm. you want to grow. I can't grow a true heirloom here. I just can't do it. Well, we struggle in Eastern North Carolina so, with it. So too. these right here, I can grow and I grow some every year. I got some planted out there this year in my garden. I love, now this is not the only tomato I grow, but it is part of the ones I grow. I like to grow a few of them. These Pink Delicious are not the most productive plants you're going to have in the garden, but it's definitely going to give you an unusual, different type look than nobody out there. Yeah, it's just like, almost a lot of way like Lemon Boy. It's just mm -hmm. something that's different that, right. uh, from a culinary perspective, it's unique and you like to show it off to people. Purple, I mean, Pink Delicious can be huge. I mean, they yep. can be really, really big fruit. Yep. And one of the biggest things probably from an heirloom is it, uh, heirloom perspective is it does not crack. It really has great crack resistance, both on the stem yeah, end and the blossom so. end. 
And that's really why my the guys that are using it on small commercial scales love it, is because it it has post harvest stability in terms of going to a stand and having, being able to last two, three, four days after you've harvested it. It really is an improvement over the brandy wines of the world or the German Johnsons of the world. So if you're doing farmers markets, roadside stands, you got to check out that brandy yeah. right there. I think it, it's a it's a. We've never trialed it with anyone that's not turned around and purchased it. Right. It's really a good variety. Paint Girl. Now, I'm not really familiar with Paint Girl, so I'll let you fill us in on that one. Older variety, pretty standard indeterminate pink, more of a traditional looking tomato. It is rather, a determinate? It's an indeterminate. Oh, I misspoke. Okay, yeah. It's an indeterminate variety, but it's more of a traditional shape. It, it basically looks a lot like a uh, a um, traditional beef steak, but pink. Okay. Um, it, it's it's If you want a traditional looking pink tomato, that was what you'd grow. Okay. All right, and this is going to be the last of our indeterminates, but I think this is off the chain, Sun Sugar. Yeah, it's been around a while, and Sun Sugar is a orange or some people, it's not a yellow, it's not an orange, it's in between, but uh, super high bricks, yeah. phenomenal eating quality. Yeah. Um, if you ever more, grow that one, you're going to grow it every a year after year after yeah, year. Yeah, it's super solid. Uh, it's, uh, I grow more plants of Sun Sugar in my garden than I do any other tomato. Um, you do want to prune it pretty aggressively because like a lot of your indeterminate cherries or grape tomato varieties They can be a little on the wild side. Yeah, so you do it want to be more aggressive with them But but not to the point maybe where you where you take a lot of the yield off mm -hmm. But you do need to be a little more um, Aggressive with pruning those just to keep them more in check a couple of plants <clears throat> is plenty plenty for the average super, gardener. super productive. Yep. Yeah, all right, so we're going to move into determinants just for a couple of varieties mm -hmm. here. We're going to switch over into determinants we were talking about, and now we're going to talk about determinants. Celebrity first. Yes. You said celebrity is one of your favorite varieties. It's a high acid tomato. It's probably, at one time, we, we estimated it was the most widely planted variety in the, in the, in the world as a, in terms of a hybrid because um, it was being grown commercially all over the world. But uh, yeah, it's. it's um, my dad's favorite tomato has been for a long time because of the high acid. And people so know it by the side. Plus, is going to have tomato spot with virus. Correct. So one of the big weaknesses of Celebrity, and I never knew why, and I probably never will know why, but it seemed to really attract thrips. And in my garden in North Carolina, we always had more spotted wilt on Celebrity than other varieties. Couldn't explain it. Don't know why. Don't know why now. But um, adding the resistance to spotted wilt to that genetics has really made Celebrity much, much more viable for, for home gardeners now than it was before, particularly if you're in Zone 7 or South. Right. And we got another mm -hmm. one called Florida 91 that's a very popular variety with us. Yeah, and it's a, it comes out of the University of Florida background, mm -hmm. um, and it is a true hot set. There's some genetics that came out of the University of Florida, I, I think it was in the 80s or 90s, that were, that were selected for ability to set in higher nighttime temperatures. Uh, people think hot set has got to do with the daytime temperatures, but it really doesn't. It's, it's more nighttime temperatures where you lose blooms. So Florida 91 is out of that background. It's one of the only true hot set still in the commercial space. So for fall production. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, transplanting more in June or July for fall production. Yeah. It, and, and one of the weird things is you don't have spotted wood as much in the fall as you exactly. do in the spring. It's thrip. It's got to do with the thrip population dynamics and all that stuff. But you can get away with growing a non-spotted wilt resistant variety in Georgia or in North Carolina in the fall when you can't in the spring. Right, so the Florida 91 is a great fall variety. Right. It's not the biggest tomato, but it's just a, like, would you say a medium size? It's a medium size. It does need, that one does need to be pruned quite okay. a bit. It's got, the, the genetics are more out of the University of Florida than they are out of our genetics. So there is there is a, a, a predicate to need to prune that one probably up to the fork or the first flower cluster. Okay. And it can take it because it's got a fairly large plant. Okay. Um, great foliar cover, which you have to have in the fall from a sun scalding perspective. Yep. Yep. Uh, and typically considered one of the more high acid. Anything with a hot set background tends to have pretty high acid. At least that's historically what has been, has been said. Now, we got a variety that I'm growing, I'm trialing in my garden this year. It's one we actually don't sell. We may sell it in the future that I'm intrigued about. It's called mm -hmm. Myrtle. Yeah, Myrtle is one that comes out of our, our, our background that's, that's for, you know, spotted wilt resistant and nematode resistant. And for southern gardeners, it's, uh, it's got that as a really nice And a determinant. Trail. And it's a determinant, and it does not need to be pruned. We do not want it pruned. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Great. 
I suspect what you'll see is a great cage tomato. So people that do traditional tomato cages, fill it up nicely, won't go out of it, won't go crazy. Um, very traditional shape, very traditional uh, type tomato from an eating quality perspective, that sort of thing. Very good solid variety. Great deal. Man, we, we have touched on some tomatoes, haven't we? Yeah. Can you taste the tomato sandwich right now? Do you love tomato sandwich? As long as you don't put mayonnaise on it. I think that's for you, really? and, I, that's for you and I part You ways. don't like mayonnaise? Can't stand it. Oh, man. Got to have mayonnaise. How do you eat a tomato sandwich without mayonnaise? Balsamic vinegar. Really? Yep. With the olive oil, balsamic that vinegar. will kick you out of North Carolina for making a statement nah. like that. <laughs> no. Balsamic vinegar. Man, that's heathenness right there. Oh, that's good stuff. Got to have that Duke's mayonnaise. I'll, I'll bring you over to the dark side. All right, I'll have to try it and see. So we got a garden spotlight of this week, folks. Is Brian Atkinson, Zone 8, O'Brien, Florida. Brian sent us in some pictures there. Oh, what is that? That's uh, radishes. Like radishes. And look at this. Look at this cages right here. Love his cages. Yep. I need to do more of those right there. These are pretty neat. The arch cages are great for yep. beans particularly. Yep. And of course Brian had to grow onions. Look at that. You know everybody has made a good onion crop this year. Same I admire anyone who can grow onions because I can't. Really? You can't do it. We are highly successful growing them down here. We got our tricks that uh, I tell everybody you know if you follow our rules you can grow onions. And that looks like some beans right there. Mm -hmm. Nice beans. and cultivated. And here's his tomatoes. He's got them caged up real nice. Got some pretty good sized tomatoes going yeah. on there, Brian. Brian in zone eight. O'Brien. Oh, I thought zone, he would have been in zone nine, but O'Brien, Florida. Thank you, Brian. Might for, be in the panhandle. Uh, yep. Corn, pole beans, watermelons, pumpkins, radishes, onions, garlic, tomatoes. He's growing it all there. All right, folks. Uh, we still have sweet potato slips yep. available. And you and I talked about it a little bit earlier. People, if you get your sweet potato slips in and they look a little bit ragged, it's Don't worry natural. About it. I tell people, I say, you could lay them out in the sun for a week and still go back and plant them and they'll come back out. Uh, I'm North Carolina is one of the largest sweet potato producing states in the country. I've got family that grows sweet potatoes. And, uh, you know, I chuckled when, when you were talking about people talking about how rough they looked. They looked good to me. I mean, <laughs> I yeah. planted a lot of sweet potatoes over the yeah. year on a, on a setter. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that you're amazed at what you put in the ground, and a week later you're Boom. amazed at what's there. Yeah, yeah. They're incredibly resilient. Yeah. Don't sweat your sweet potatoes being no. a little wilted or a little yellow. That's normal. They'll no. Bounce back out in no time. Uh, tomato plugs. We're about ready to wind it down on tomato plugs. We're looking to see what our inventory is. So. If we've still got tomatoes, they'll be online. If not, then you'll know we're with this. About time. Good looking plant, though. Yeah, about time for us to switch off the tomato plants. We're working on something that uh, we may bring. I shouldn't even bring it up. Turmeric. We're working on a little project with yeah. that. You may see turmeric on our site within the next little. Really minute. interesting. It is, and you know, it has a lot of health benefits. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. So on the old goat drawing, there's an old goat figurine here on the shelf here somewhere. And, Tough to find today. And if you found it last week, we, we put you in a drawer and we're going to draw out your name and you're going to get a special gift and I'll let you do the draw. All right, let's see what we got. Margie Lane. Margie Lane. Margie Lane, you are the winner of the Old Goat. If you know where the Old Goat's at, put it in the comments below and we'll put you in the drawing for next week. On the old goat drawing. Or just send us your address, shipping address to cuss serve, and we'll get you something sent out there. So we got a little something special we've been doing for the last little bit here. Monterey mm -hmm. is sponsoring a giveaway at the end of our show. And we'll talk about these here just a little bit. Because I'm probably you're probably familiar with a couple of these products. Oh yeah, I used to put out yellow sticky traps. Yep. When I was in, uh, you know, products. they are coming back around somewhat for the home gardener. You know, they're used for control and for monitoring. Monitoring for yep. what we were using them for, yep. Yep. So you can use these right out here, the yellow sticky traps, and then we've got the uh, Monterey Complete Disease Control. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with this product? Do you I'm remember familiar with it, yep. Serenade? Oh yeah, Serenades. This is a cousin of Serenade. Okay, yeah. Yep. So this is a biological right here, a biological disease control. And of course, we've got the horticulture oil that's going to work great on those soft body insects yep. right there. Aphids in particular. And the good thing about this one is it won't burn. So this is a refined oil that you can spray all during the day right here. It's a good one right there. It's a great maintenance chemistry. Yeah, and it's safe. Yeah, you can you can use it multiple times. Right. And of course, we got some fish going on. You got to have a little fertilizer out there for those plants. 
Model Race sponsoring this giveaway right here. We got these four products right here that we're giving away every week. And last week it was they had to put in their comments how they like their okra fried. Okay. And they said fried. I said how they like their okra prepared. They liked it fried. And the winner was Lucinia. Am I saying that right? Lucinia. Lucinda. Lucinda Borkin. Lucinda Borkin, you was the winner last week. So send us your uh, shipping address to CustServeHostools.com and we'll get this great Monterey giveaway out to you. Good now, stuff. the question is, what are we going to do for next week's winner of the Monterey giveaway? We got to have in the comments below what question. This is one I think. What indeterminate tomato variety is your favorite? Hmm. Put that in the comment below and that'll put you in the drawing for this giveaway right here. Cool. Yep. Well, thank you, Peter. I think we touched on indeterminates a little bit today. Yeah. Don't get carried away by seeing some of this stuff on YouTube out there. Make sure you got good sound advice as you got today on your pruning and your sucker and your indeterminates. And I think you'll be successful. Agree. Yep. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, sir. Yep. All right. Y'all have a good one. And that's time for you to get outside and get dirty.